Greetings, friend. Timberlake here. I'm going to analyze a solve by Mark Goodliff, cracking the cryptic fame. This was a video called Techniques for Hard Sudoku from 5 May 2020. The puzzle was submitted by Joe. Doesn't say who created the puzzle itself. Um, I put this through a solver. It's rated extreme, yet Mark solves it in about 17 minutes. I'm really curious to see how he did it. And with that, it's solving time. So, Mark looks through and starts with, you know, Snyder notation and seeing what crosshatch he can do. Snyder notation, which he actually explains to the viewers, I think a lot of them were pretty new to the channel, is when you can mark just two spots in any particular uh, block, you would make those marks. And so he starts off finding this three because of the threes in rows four and five. And then he finds a one because of the ones here in rows five, column nine. And then he finds this five. And this is a naked single. And it's actually pretty impressive how he found that. Uh, you know, I've done the video on different ways to find and solve a single cell. But he says, hey, look here. You have this one, two, three, four, six. And then you look at the seven, nine with the eight. And of course, that has to be a five. Nice. And from there, he goes, well, uh, there's only two cells left, so I'm going to mark those sevens and nines. So that's a naked pair. And from there, he looks over at the fours, makes only two fours right there. Uh, the beauty of Snyder notation is that if you solve one of these cells, the other one will automatically be a four. And you'll see that comes into play here shortly. So he's got two twos here and uh, marks those. And then he realizes, oh, hey, I can solve this for six. Six in columns four and five and row Four. And by solving that for a six, he notices that he can solve a six right here because of the six in column two, which means we can solve for a four. And that's the beauty of Snyder notation right there. And then he continues with the sixes and notices a seven, six here in row seven and columns two and three. And continues on with the sixes able to solve that six down there in block nine and then moves up towards block three and notices with the two sixes two and three solve a six right there and now he goes back to the ones so there's a one to come across row four a one going down column one only one place left for one right there uh after the one he sees this five cuts across and says there's only two places for a five so he'll make those marks for that five. Then he puts his focus back on the ones and notices you got a one coming down column six, rows eight and nine, only one place left for a one right there. And then if you move up here to block two, only one place for a one up there. And if you move over to block three, only one place for a one right there. And he turns his attention towards the eights. So he's thinking for a while, he sees an eight in row six, an eight in column one, only one place left for an eight in block four. Looks in between block five and marks where the eights can be there. And now Mark looks at uh, the fives and notices, oh, the fives are in the same two spots as the twos. So that creates a naked pair to five. And because you have a naked pair here, Mark notices that you can put seven and nine to finish off row six. And you'll see this quite a bit. If you can put a naked pair into a block or a column or a row that has one empty cell, well, you can automatically solve that empty cell, right? And so you can solve that for five. So he comes across row four and finishes off the seven and nine because those are the only two uh, candidates remaining for row four. And at this point, Mark focuses on block, a column, or excuse me, block five, and decides to fill in the rest of block five. It's, an, it's a naked triple. It's a seven and nine naked triple. And normally at Snyder, you wouldn't do all that. Uh, but he wanted to do it just to kind of know that, hey, yes, I've looked at this block, and that's all that's remaining. Uh, and that's pretty common to do that. Okay, turn his focus on the twos, 
Notice there's a two here in row eight in column nine. So there's only two places left for a two in block nine. And then he marks, he takes this two, comes up, and says, oh, there's only two places left for a two up here in block two. This is pretty handy because now these twos are like a pointing pair. And so you might get some more mileage out of that if, if there are some more restrictions going on in block three or block one. And at this point, Mark's starting to slow down a little bit, trying to find where to put more restrictions. But he sees the threes here in columns four and five. And so he's able to mark these two spots for a three down here in block eight. And now Mark sees the two covers these three spots in row nine. And this two covers this spot in row uh, nine, column three. So there's only one place left for two in row nine. And then he decides to mark some spots where the twos could be in column one because you have a two here in columns uh, two and three. And then he's noticed, even though he solved a lot of cells, there's a lot of restrictions here. And he wondered, he's like, I wonder if I need to start marking where the by value cells are. And I've seen Simon do this technique as well. Once you're done kind of doing the scenario notation, look for by value restrictions because that will help you out with some of the more advanced techniques you know the x-wings and the uh, xy wings and, and things of those of that nature and so he marks first uh, three seven down here because he's looking at these cells where they have most of the cells filled in with some candidates coming in and then he comes up over here and marks a seven and an eight and then he comes down here and marks a three and eight. And if you notice these cells, you know, this, there's three cells not solved in column two, but there's also some uh, candidates coming across, or some, cell, uh, yeah, digits coming across row eight. So that's why you looked here. If you come up here, four cells remaining here in row three, but you had some coming up column nine. So that's why you looked here. And then in here, you have quite a bit in the block to go along with the, with the column. And so that's why you picked those cells for the by value cells. Okay, after doing those things, you might wonder, well, if he started going by value cells, was there anything else he might have missed? And so I'll look at that right now. So here's the grid where Mark was, and the question was, is there anything else he could have done, any more marking, any more cells he could solve prior to starting to look at the by value cells? The answer, surprisingly, is, is no. There's really not much he could do. The only thing he could down here, and he actually gets it really quickly. Is there's a nine right here, which prevents a nine from being in column two here, and so that the nines have to be in these two spots. So he could have marked those for nine, and that's it. That's it for the Snyder notation. Uh, he started looking for the by value cells. I'll show you something here to kind of help you see the by value cells that he had already marked and what he could have could have uh, maybe looked at and you'll see is I'm going to get rid of some of these extra marks from things that he had marks about. Uh, he could have went here and saw a 7-8. He doesn't actually mark that. He did already have this 7-8, this 7-9, and you'll see here he gets to this 7-8 right here, this 3-8 right here, and this 3-7, which are all pretty critical to helping to solve this puzzle. And he does eventually kind of look down here, this 4-5 and 5-9. Um, those are all, all the by value cells. He, he focuses on this one, this one, this one, as you see here in a second. Okay, we're back. After filling this 3-8 out, Mark notices the 9 here in row 8, and there's only two spots left for a 9 in column 2. And this is where it gets really cool, because Mark finds a very advanced strategy at this point. He looks at this particular cell and says, what would happen if it's a 3 or a 7 on the effect of this block? And he goes, well, if this is a 3, then there couldn't be a 3 here, here, or here because of these 3s. So that the, the 3 would have to be here in row 9, column 6. But then he says, well, if this is a 7, the 7s are covering rows 8 and 9, that would have to be a 7, and this would still be a 3. And so Mark is able to solve this cell for a 3 no matter what this value is. Is it bifurcation? I don't know, but it is illogical. He, he said, it, no matter what this value is right here, this has to be three. So he always solve that for a three. 
So now it brings up to the what if moment. You know, what is the actual strategy Mark found that can map all this? And what if he didn't find that? Where else could you move in this puzzle? And I'll show you that right now. So what if Mark here didn't find the uh, alternate interest chain? Is it an alternate interest chain? That's what I'm about to tell you. So you notice I've already done up this uh, Sudoku with all of the candidates. Uh, with my what I call the Christmas lights and I'll put a link right here where you can check out AIC type 1 tutorial and I went through and said all right is this an alternate interest chain the answer is yes I was able to find one that leads to the solve that Mark found and I'll tell you Mark's way his logical way is much easier than running through this, this inference chain but I'm going to show you that this is why the logic works so you start right here at the cell we were focusing on right row 9 column 6 and you go up here and you go strong yeah, everything in red, you know, is going to be a strong link there, right? Strong, weak to this three, strong that eight. Weak to this eight, strong to this seven. Weak to the seven, strong to this seven. Weak to this nine, strong to this nine. Weak to this nine down here, which is a circuit strong link, actually. Strong to that five. Weak to this five, strong to that four. Weak to this four, strong to that four. Weak to this 5, strong to that 5. Weak to this 3, strong to this 3 right here. And so what that tells you is if this is either a 3, if that's not a 3, then this is a 3. And so we can eliminate any 3s that see both of those orange cells, which you'd be able to eliminate a 3 right here, and the only 3 left in long row 9 is right here, row 9, column 6. So you could solve that for a 3 and you move on. That's how you do the alternate inference chain. Crazy, huh? Yeah, a lot harder to find. I'm amazed with how Mark made it work with the sevens and the threes coming in down here in row seven, eight, and nine. Let's go back to the main puzzle. And we're back. And now after solving the three, Mark puts in the naked triple remaining in row nine, four, fives, and nines down there. And then he's able to go back and actually solve this for a three. And this is where it gets really cool again. Mark is able to solve another cell kind of using some pretty advanced logic here. He's trying to figure out this cell. And he looks over at, at here, believe it or not, where he had marked a seven and eight. He goes, if this is a seven, that's a nine, and that's a seven. And if that's a seven, then where can a seven be in block Eight. It has to be in one of these two spots. So if a seven is in one of these two spots, this would be a three, right? So in that case, it's a three. We said if this is an eight, the only other cho choice, then this would be a three. And if that's a three, the only place for a three in block seven is right here. So either way, he was able to solve this cell for a three. Now you're probably wondering, okay, what technique was that that would have allowed it logic-wise? And what else could he have found? And I'll do that. So this is our second what if moment. And I'll show you the logic behind how this end has to end up being a three. Three, two, one. Okay, so how does the logic work really for Mark solve figuring out you know that this had to be a three? It's another alternate inference chain. It's a and it's pretty hard to see. I mean, really the way he did it, just going, okay, this three or seven, what would happen? Is really cool. Well, here's why it would happen. So we'll start this cell. Strong to this three, weak to this five. Strong to that five, weak to this four, strong to that four. Weak to this four, strong to that five. Weak to this five, strong to that nine. Weak to this nine, strong to that nine. Weak to this nine, strong to that seven. Weak to this seven, strong to this eight. Weak to this eight, strong to this three right here. So. If this is a three, that can't be a three. If this is not a three, we figure out that that has to be a three right there. And so you can eliminate this three. That's the chain. That is what Mark had basically just said, hey, what well, if this is three or seven? How does it affect the rest of this grid? Pretty cool, huh? Uh, again, I'm pretty floored by how Mark found this. Let's go back to the main solve. And we're back. After solves for three, Mark puts in the sevens up here 
in row seven, columns one and three. And it starts looking at these four cells. Okay, so what I wanted to point out here about uniqueness. You know, I have these four cells. This is what Mark was looking at. Pause the video and solve for this cell right here while I give you a few seconds. Okay, those of you able to do it, congratulations. You understand how uniqueness works. Those of you who just want to enjoy the show, this cell is a nine. Why is that a nine? Well, here's how uniqueness works. You have a seven, nine, seven, nine, four, seven, nine, four, seven, nine. This puzzle has one unique solution. And so we, in this case, a four has to be in one of these two spots. Why? Because if four wasn't there, you could go and solve this puzzle, seven, seven, nine, and nine, and then go back and just change it and go nine, nine, seven, seven. You'd have two solutions, same puzzle. We know it's a unique solution. So if you see these additional candidates beyond the seven and the nine, you basically know that that additional candidate that shares itself has to be in one of those two cells. And since the four has to be in one of these cells, it can't be down there, and you can solve that for a nine. Mark alludes to this, and he says, oh, I want to find another way to solve that logically. And I don't blame him. Um, you know, I do too. And he does show that in another, you know, further on in this puzzle. Mark does eventually get to solve this through another method, but I wanted to show that to you here to see how uniqueness works and how it cuts through uh, some of these methods. And, and the other thing to keep in mind is you can usually solve something that's uniqueness through another method like an X, Y chain. Um, but if you see this, it's a shortcut. I say if this puzzle has a unique solution, uniqueness works. If it doesn't have a unique solution, it's off the table. That's easy. Let's go back to the main solve. And deciding not to solve this for uniqueness, Mark moves up and notices, okay, there's only, you know, the sevens and nines have to be up here to finish off column two. And then he notices the three five and the threes and the fives create another naked pair here in column three. And he's able to solve an eight by seeing the eight coming up column one because uh, the only place left for an eight is that empty cell in row three, column three. Then he finishes off the naked pair up here in block one. And after finishing the two, four naked pair up here, he finishes up the naked pair down in uh, the rest of column one. Then notices, hey, uh, I saw that for an eight. It has to be a seven over there, and I can solve that for a nine. And I can solve the seven, nine, and finish off that naked triple he had marked before. And by doing this naked triple here, he looks down and says, oh, I'm going to be able to solve all these cells right here and show you without using uniqueness that that was still a nine. Pretty cool. Uh, coming up, since this is a nine, he's able to finish off block four with the seven and the nine. And then he can solve the seven right there and finish off block seven with the four. And it was in this position with 26 cells remaining that Mark cracks the puzzle. It's all naked and hidden sing singles from here. Follow along if you want as I go through all the remaining cells. I found this a very cool solve. I thought that Mark may have done some more bifurcation when I saw how hard the puzzle was. Uh, his logic I thought was pretty clean and crisp. A lot of the viewers were real excited about this. They were calling Mark a genius. They were saying uh, they appreciated the explanation about Snyder notation because they were kind of new to the channel and hadn't seen Snyder before. And they also said that his explanations and solving were getting better. I guess in some of his previous videos, he kind of went through the solve really quick without really explaining how he did it. Did you try to solve this puzzle? How did it go for you? Also, let me know any other comments you may have in, uh, below. While you're at it, don't forget to like, share, subscribe to more hobbies. Don't miss any new content. I come out with new videos at least every Friday and Sunday each week. Thank you all so much for watching.